1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27 says, Just as a body through one has many parts, but all its many parts <coughs> from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or f- body, slave or free. And we were all given the, the, the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. I would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, <coughs> every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we think with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts have no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there would should be no division in the body, but that is its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is the part of it. This is the word of the Lord. So once upon a time, two men found themselves seated next to each other at an airport gate, and they had some time, and the one man was, was reading, and the, the other asked him what he was reading. He said he was reading the Bible. He said, oh, that's wonderful. I'm a Christian too. Wow, where, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to a church conference. Oh, what church? He said, well, uh, uh, holiness church. He said, holiness? That's incredible. United holiness? He said, yeah, united holiness. First man pondered for a minute. He said, Western or Eastern United Holiness? I said, Western? I said, me too! That's amazing! First or second dispensation? I said, second. I said, well, this is amazing. Remember, it seemed to be members of the same church. Well, small world. Now, wait, wait a minute, wait a, just one second here. Conference of 1967 or Conference of 1972? And the first man said, well, 1972. Second man said, spit on the ground, said, burn in hell, heretic. Got up and walked away. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The point of this is, uh, the reason I I tell you that joke, and I didn't didn't make that up, so if it's bad, blame somebody else. I don't even know who made it. I I don't know who to blame, but don't blame somebody. Don't blame me. Anyhow, the point I tell you that is uh, that that sometimes uh, it is hard when we're standing up and we're confessing the faith of the church, and we're confessing, in the words of the Apostles' Creed, that I believe in the holy Catholic church, small c, right? I screwed that up in the bulletin. There are two problems with that. Sometimes that the church... The, the message of reality is the church very often doesn't look very holy, nor does it look very Catholic, very united, very universal. It can look like a mess. Um, now, why? Why it can look like a mess? This is not hard to figure out. You know the answer. The answer is sin. This is the trouble with the church. You know, it's full of sinners. And... Uh, I just happen to be the one wearing a tie. Full of sinners. Um, That's why we're here. The church is not a club for saints. The church is a hospital for sinners, but that does cause problems because you've got a whole bunch of sinners working together, and and sometimes it can get messy. Um, 
This, this theme, by the way, this is a theme that runs through the Bible. The idea that sin not only divides us from God, not only separates us from our maker, but sin divides people from one another, right? Open this, open this book right at the beginning, right? Chapter 3. You're two pages in. Sin enters the world. Chapter 4. Murder. Didn't take very long, did it? <laughs> Half a page. Um, you see, you know, fourth chapter. After murdering his brother in a fit of jealousy, Cain. And what does he do after he, he murders his brother? He flees his family. He flees in fear. The only people he's ever known, and I mean, for that matter, the only people, right? Greed for land. Greed for land separated Abraham and Lot. When Abraham and Lot's servants were, were fighting against one another. Jacob. Jacob tricked his brother Esau out of his inheritance and lived in fear of Esau for the rest of his life. Jealous of Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. And mind you, that's only Genesis. That's only Genesis. There are more examples than I can possibly remember, let alone share. But it, it, it's, this, the, the point stands that our sin separates us from God. And the only, the only solution to that is the blood of Jesus Christ. And our sin separates us from other people. And guess what? The only solution to that... <laughs> Are you all alive today? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a, the only solution to that is the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Because, uh, I, I mean, I can, we have a defibrillator over here somewhere. We can, <laughs> it, it, I don't know if we have enough battery charge for all of you. I can only jump and shout so much, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That, that our sin separates us from one another. This is not dry theological speculation. This is everyday reality. This is as practical as it gets. Sin separates sinners. Sin separates uh, sinners. Look, you know from your own experiences how quickly an office or a classroom or a workshop or anywhere else that you live and work and whatever can be overwhelmed by petty jealousy and anger to the point that nothing gets done and you simply can't stay there. Um, the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus' work is the story, yes, of restoring sinners to God through his death and his resurrection by his blood restoring the fallen to their maker, but it's also the story of restoring sinners to one another, of uniting people who have no other cause to be united, who have no other hope for unity. This is something that we, we forget too often, right? When the Bible speaks of salvation, it's speaking of, a, a, yes, of a deeply personal relationship with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. No one can stand in for you in that relationship any more than anyone could stand in for you in your marriage or anyone could stand in for you in your family. You've got to go to the Lord yourself, right? You've got to confess your own sins. Somebody else can't confess your sins for you. You've got to trust Jesus with your own heart and mind. Somebody else can't trust Jesus for you. You've got to taste the glories of the Lord's grace firsthand, right? It is profoundly personal. And yet, at the same time, your salvation is not private. It's personal, but it's not private. God doesn't save people in splendid isolation from one another. He calls a whole people. He calls a whole people together to be his own possession a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now at first, of course, at first God's holy nation was literally that. It was a holy nation. It was the nation of, of Israel. right? Alone of all the peoples on the earth, alone of all the peoples on the earth, Israel knew the true God. 
Not in a vague or a shadowy way, but clearly as he revealed himself. And it was to Israel that God intended, through Israel, excuse me, that God intended to make his glory known. He said to, through Isaiah, Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. What happened through the work of Jesus on the cross is that that promise was extended, not just to ethnic Israel, but that promise was extended to all who responded to the gospel call to repent and come to Jesus. He promised his disciples that when he was lifted up on the cross, he said he would draw all men to himself, right? not just the children of Israel, that he would bind them together as one, just as he and the Father are one. This new society, this creation, this body, he called the church, ecclesia in Greek. Ecclesia is a really interesting word. I know you don't think so. That's cool. Just indulge me for 20 seconds here. Ecclesia comes from ek. Uh, which it means out of, it's, we, we are related to our word exit, right? Ek and kaleo, kaleo is a verb that means to call. So ecclesia, church, literally means those who are called out. Those who are called out. So if the question is, how did you end up being, how, how did you end up in the church? Short answer, you were called out by God, whether you know it or not, right? Called out by God from the world and gathered into what the first chapter of Revelation calls a kingdom of priests to God the Father. Nothing less. You are nothing less. And I don't mean this congregation. I mean you as, as members of the one body of Christ. You are nothing less than God's chosen instrument for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the world. There's not a plan B, by the way. <laughs> right? It's not like, oh, well, if we don't do it, somebody... No, you're going to do it. It's that important. At the head of the church is Christ himself. It's life, it's driving force, if you like, is the Holy Spirit at work, and its members are the hands and the feet of Christ on earth. Their life together is the model for the rest of humanity, and the destiny of the church is glorious. Now, here's where I have to admit that if you've been sitting here for more than, I don't know, once... <laughs> If you've been here more than once, you can read all that and you can think, yes, 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 that's the church, that's the church. And then you can look around you and think, oh dear. I think my baby just went down the stairs, didn't he? Is he okay? Okay. I have to check once in a while. Sorry. Um, you may be wondering whether we're talking about the same organization here. Um, by the way, if you happen to attend my funeral... Talk me up. Talk me up hard. <laughs> Say nice things. Make stuff up if you have to. <laughs> Everyone else does. <laughs> Make it so that people are sitting in that, in that funeral thinking, is that the same guy I knew? I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. Just tell the truth. Everybody knows it anyway. It doesn't matter. But this is what people do at funerals, right? Sometimes you hear... I, like, I am, I am sitting there, and I know this guy. And the guy that's being described, who is wonderful, <laughs> doesn't sound like that guy. <laughs> and sometimes the description of the church in Scripture can sound like that. You think, well, this sounds great, but, the, but what I actually see is a little more ugly and, and divided and everything else. Um, and I'll forgive you, if you for thinking that if the church is part of God's plan to overcome the divisions between human beings, then he'd better have a backup. Because, <laughs> I mean, drive down the road, right? Um, I once counted, and I figured out that um, 
within, I think it was six miles of here, there are at least a dozen different gatherings of Christians no, re representing no fewer than eight denominations, uh, several of which, as just a nice touch, don't recognize the others as, as Christians. <laughs> Confessing, now here, and, and here's my only response to that, and that is that when we're confessing faith in the church, the holy Catholic church, small c, we're really talking about two different entities. We're really talking about two different things. The first is what is ordinarily called the church invisible. The invisible church, which sounds far cooler than, than um, sorry, I, my mind just went to Wonder Woman there for a minute. <laughs> what, invisible jet, invisible church, right? You ever wonder how she found that jet? Like when you, she parks it? Sorry, got off track. The invisible church. When we talk about the invisible church, what we're talking about is the mystical body of Christ, right? What we're talking about is the body that includes every believer, every genuine believer. Those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, called out from the world into the kingdom of his light from every tribe, tongue, and nation, to use the language of Revelation 4 and 5. Every tribe, tongue, and nation on all the earth. We recognize, this is the body of Christ, right? When, when, when uh, Bella read, we are one, you are one body and members of it. That's what we're talking about. The, the church that we can't always see with our eyes, but we confess in faith. The church that is, in spite of all those visible distinctions, holy. Why is it holy? It's not holy because the people are awesome. It's holy because Christ has called her holy. Holy. These are people who, who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and called together, right? Holy, Catholic. By the way, I'm not surrendering that word. I know people who, when they say the Apostles' Creed, they won't say the word Catholic. Partly, I, I won't surrender it because it seems a little rude to our, our, my Roman Catholic friends, but partly also because the word itself is is, is perfectly okay. The word, it, it, and it's important, actually. By the way, if you want to mess with your Catholic friends, do you? <laughs> Try these two things on for size. Um, <laughs> or if you want to mess with your Catholic husband, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, try these two things on for size. One is insist that you believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which I do. Just not exactly the same. The other is insist, I insist that I, I am, I'm a Catholic. Small c, right? What I mean by that is that I don't hold myself apart from the church. I'm not looking, and it's actually a compliment, because I'm I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not looking down my nose and saying, you people. No, I'm saying, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, if you hold to the faith once delivered to the saints, if we have the same one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4, right, that's like verse 8, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, then we are one body. Yeah, you know what? There are still and there are vis visible di divisions. Those visible divisions, they're scandalous. I agree. But for all that, there is a much deeper, deeper unity. You know what? I, I see this all the time. When I, I, you get the chance to work with other Christians, whether they are Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists or Pentecostal or Orthodox or Roman Catholic, whatever, and you find out that are there, are there things about which you disagree? Of course there are. But there's a glorious moment when you find someone you discover they serve the same Lord you do. When you discover that they hold the same faith that you do and when you discover that you're on the same team. That's a beautiful thing. It really is. That in spite of all the divisions, there is in fact one body. In spite of all the divisions, there is in fact one body. And you are members of it. Um, 
Now, the second, that's the invisible church. Now, the truth is, though, that that's not what we see with our eyes, right? What we see with our eyes is what the is theologians traditionally refer to as the visible church. And that's like actual congregations. Real live people sitting out here. Now, here's the thing about the visible church. Not everyone in the visible church is a visible Christian. I'm not naming names. <laughs> I can't name names, because what do I know? I can't see into your hearts. But I do recognize, because Scripture tells me that not all in Israel are of Israel. That's what Paul says in Romans, right? Not all in Israel are of Israel. God alone sees the human heart. He knows who is sincere and who is not. Jesus warns that when they stand before him, he says, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, only to be told, I never knew you, go away. The true church is invisible. The true church is made up of every believer in every age who genuinely loves Christ and trusts in him for his salvation. The visible church, what we see around us, overlaps with the true invisible church, but they're not the same exactly. I meant to have a Venn diagram for you because I think that's what works best here, but I don't have it. So imagine a Venn diagram <laughs> where there's an overlapping bit, but there are parts that don't overlap. Um, and this is just, this is, we know this, right? We know this deep down, that to be a member of a congregation, to sit in the pew on Sunday, to say with your lips that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is no guarantee that you actually do. We understand this at least intuitively. Unfortunately, people use that as a justification not to participate in the life of the visible church, of a local congregation. If Sunday worship is no guarantee of salvation, then why worship with other Christians? It's full of hypocrites, the church. Now, um, I have one response to that, that, that argument, um, and, and it's this. To claim that you are a member of the one holy, universal, apostolic church without actually participating in a local congregation is like saying that you're a Boy Scout, but you don't belong to any particular troop. You might be. But it's weird. <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. As for the argument that the church is frequently petty, and not very Christ-like, all I can say is, yeah, it is. Again, this is not a club for saints. This is a hospital for sinners. I hope, if I can get anything in your head, if I can, if I can share anything with you over the years, I hope that it is that, you, you know, we're not superior types of people. We're simply sinners who know the cure. That's all. All we've got to rely on is the grace and the mercy of God. And that's the whole point. That participating together in, 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 in the visible church, having to actually deal with other Christians, is a glorious school in humility and in love and in patience and in kindness and in all of those virtues that make up a Christ-like character. If you can't, I tell the people this about marriage, this is what marriage is in its, in its most basic element, is, is the school in which we learn to love our neighbor as ourselves by having to live with our neighbor for 55 years. <laughs> and having our neighbor leave their socks on the floor and things like that, right? Likewise, the church is a training ground where we learn to love and to serve together by having to love and serve with, with actual other people. So, uh, for all its imperfections, look, the church is, is the guardian of the truth, a living witness to the gospel, a link to the saints who have gone before to their eternal reward, the body and the bride of Christ. Thank God for it. Amen.